Uh, Senator, let's start with the, uh, with the uh, death of uh, Justice Scalia and uh, uh, Leader McConnell's decision very quickly to preclude uh, a nominee being offered by uh, Barack Obama. What were your thoughts about that at that moment? First of all, I was very surprised to learn of Senator McConnell's decision. This was not a case where he consulted with all of us in the caucus. To be fair, we were all spread all over the country, uh, perhaps around the world, so it would have been difficult for him to do so. But he immediately made a decision that we would not even consider a nominee that was proposed by President Obama. And I disagreed with that decision. The president is still the president and under the Constitution has the right to nominate judicial uh, nominees. So I was surprised, particularly since this wasn't a case where the election was going to be in the next month. It was many months before the election. And, and Garland, Judge Garland, strikes me as somebody that you might have liked uh, judicially as a, as a uh, he lands in the right place on a lot of issues, a moderate certainly, maybe even a conservative moderate. How did you feel about it? And, and did you meet with Garland? All I knew is I felt that Merrick Garland deserved a hearing and deserve the normal process. If members wanted to vote against him for whatever reason, they could do so. But to not even allow the Judiciary Committee to hold a hearing on his nomination just did not sit right with me. The irony is, of course, is that the left was very annoyed at President Obama for appointing such a centrist judge as his nominee. <laughs> I did meet with Merrick Garland. I had a very good discussion with him. I also happened to know an individual in Maine who is now the U.S. attorney who had clerked for him. And when I checked him out, when I checked the judge out, uh, with my friend in Maine, he received very high reviews. Now, I did not do the kind of in-depth analysis of his record, but I do think that it's noteworthy that when I was reviewing Judge Kavanaugh's record on the D.C. Circuit, that he and Judge Garland voted the same 93% of the time hmm. on the cases that they heard together. How does, uh, how does McConnell keep the discipline among the, in the caucus at a moment like that? If there's enough of you that want to move it forward, how does he, and what is his master plan that you're sort of either instructed to or buy into? To be fair, I was very much in a minority. Many people, most of the members of our caucus praised Senator McConnell for his decision and felt that he was very um, farsighted in what he decided to do. Also, I should point out um, that very shortly after Senator McConnell made his decision, a video of then Senator Joe Biden, when he was chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, surfaced in which he said that there would be no confirmation of any Supreme Court judge during the last year of President Bush's term should a vacancy arise. So Senator McConnell legitimately was able to point to a prominent Democratic senator, indeed someone who became vice president, who essentially established that precedent. I don't think it was right in either case. Let me tell you, that's the so-called Biden rule you're talking about, right? Let yes. Me, let, me, let me bring you to a, another moment uh, closer in time to now, which is uh, that first day of the uh, hearings, uh, the committee's hearings, 
I, I watched the videotape last weekend again of everybody filing into the room. The Democrats are there, the Republicans are there. Uh, Senator Grassley is tapping the, the gavel. Uh, there's protesters in the back of the room. There's been protesters in the hallways. And it just, chaos ensues. In some ways, some people we've talked to said, well, this is just an example of the partisanship gone mad right away in the beginning of this hearing. How did you read what was happening, Senator? I was embarrassed for the Senate when Chairman Grassley was not even allowed to complete his opening statement before being interrupted by Democratic senators in what was clearly an orchestrated move. I was very worried about the confirmation process. We've seen a gradual but persistent politicization of the judicial nomination process for Supreme Court nominees over the past 30 years. And this seemed to me to be a new low when the chairman is not even allowed to deliver without interruptions by his fellow senators, not to mention the protesters, his opening statement. And that worries me because the Supreme Court should be above politics. I'm not naive on how the system works. I understand that presidents are going to appoint nominees who reflect their general philosophy. But our job under the Constitution is a very solemn one. Our advice and consent duty is one that requires us to review a nominee's qualifications and, in my judgment, determine whether or not the nominee is it within the mainstream of judicial philosophy. You, as the way I go back and read it and talk to people, you become the person kind of on the bubble for McConnell and others. You are the vote. If he's counting heads and it's going to come right down uh, on Kavanaugh, you flake maybe Murakowski, maybe Heitkamp and Manchin. There's just a few people who haven't sort of, don't. he doesn't seem to have in his pocket in some way. Uh, put, describe your position at the beginning of those hearings uh, as, uh, as you're being probably seen by Senator McConnell and, and others. Well, first, to me, it is very telling that we're so polarized right now that we had outside ideologically driven interest groups that were putting out press releases in opposition to President Trump nominee before they even knew who the nominee was. Right. And in fact, one press release actually says, uh, oppose Judge XXX. <laughs> they forgot to fill in the judge's name. And people on both sides of the aisle very quickly took positions on Judge Kavanaugh before they knew anything about him or very little about him. I don't understand that. That is not my approach. The number of us who were truly undecided was probably fewer than 10. And we talked frequently. We were determined, even though we didn't come out in the same place, but we were determined to go through a thorough process. And I was very worried about what the process said to the American people. I want the American people to have faith in our government institutions and the courts most of all. We know and expect that the executive branch and the Congress are going to be political. But the judiciary is supposed to be above politics. Right. And what I saw was a process with Judge Kavanaugh that quickly became a dysfunctional circus and really the low point in a steady decline in the dignity of the nomination process. Why, Senator? 
Because we had senators who had already made up their minds before they had heard a word of testimony from the nominee. And that was true on both sides of the aisle. We had outside groups that were determined to destroy Justice Kavanaugh and just because he was appointed by President Trump. It would not have mattered if President Trump, in my view, had nominated Merrick Garland. Hmm. I think they still would have opposed uh, the nominee simply because of the identity of the president. When I have looked at Supreme Court nominees over the years that I've been privileged to serve, I have not considered the political party nor the identity of the president who made the appointment. And that has led me to vote for justices who are more liberal than I am, such as Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor, who were uh, nominated by President Obama. It has also caused me to vote for Justice Alito, who is more conservative than I am. But all of them were within the mainstream of judicial thought each of them was highly qualified for the position. And I was convinced that all of them would respect precedent, the rule of law, and the role of an independent judiciary. When uh, you hear of the allegations uh, by Dr. Blasey Ford, what, what, what was your thinking about what should happen uh, in the committee? I've read the redacted letter that Dr. Ford sent to Senator Feinstein just as soon as I learned about it. I received a call from the Judiciary Committee staff and I read the letter that day. It was redacted, her name did not appear, and there were some details that were redacted in the letter. But I was very concerned about the allegations, which were extremely serious. It was clear that she had asked that her identity be kept uh, from the public, that she did not seek the limelight. And I think it was disgraceful that someone leaked her identity to the Washington Post. And let me add that I do not believe that that was Senator Feinstein who did that. Um, I have a lot of respect for Senator Feinstein. She's told me she did not do it, and I believe that she did not. But someone betrayed the trust of Christine Blasey Ford, and I think that was despicable. So when I read the allegations, I was very concerned. I had. I was at the stage where I had completed most of my review, not all of it, but most of my review of Judge Kavanaugh's record during his 12 years on the circuit court. I assembled a team of 19 attorneys, mm -hmm. many of them from the Congressional Research Service who are nonpartisan, to help me go through his decisions, his law review articles, his speeches. So I had largely finished my review of his record, and I had spent two hours and 15 minutes talking with the judge, asking him tough questions. So then this bombshell letter drops and sends the nomination process into a tailspin. The very next day after I read the then redacted letter, I talked to Judge Kavanaugh. I had some additional questions that I wanted to ask him about his record, but I, of course, asked him about the allegations in the letter. I asked him whether they were true, whether there was any truth in them. He was emphatic in his denial. I then asked him if he had any idea who would have made the allegations or why they were made and he said that he did not. Mm -hmm. 
The, then that Sunday, the story broke in the Washington Post identifying the individual. And I felt at that point, once Dr. Ford's identity became known, um, that the only option was for the Senate Judiciary Committee to convene and have a hearing in which both Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh testified at length under oath. After she spoke, we've asked everybody this question, uh, then there's a break, but after she spoke, what were your thoughts? I had found what she said to be very painful. I was convinced that she had been sexually assaulted, but I did not know for certain who was her assailant. I felt that she was traumatized and that it was a huge burden on her to come forward and that she was indeed frightened. I felt bad that her family wasn't there with her to support her, that her, her parents and her brothers. Um, and I thought that was odd. But I found her to be credible in asserting that something terrible had happened to her. Do you think that some people we've talked to say that when when uh, uh, Brett Kavanaugh comes out to speak, he, he, a he's speaking to one an audience of one, Donald Trump, and b he had to be forceful. He had to be different than he'd been on the Fox News interview. He had to defend himself in a way, but not go too far. Uh, give me your reaction to him coming out uh, and, 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 what, and how, you, how you judged his performance. I thought about all that the judge and his family had been through. Keep in mind that the allegations were not those just of Professor Ford's. He had been accused of drugging teen girls and participating in gang rapes, an allegation for which there was absolutely no substantiation, an outrageous allegation, but one which his young daughters had heard. So I was not surprised that he was both anguished and angry. I think that's a normal reaction for a human being who's been accused of absolutely despicable, heinous crimes to have. And I felt that he went too far in his exchanges with senators, such as Amy Klobuchar, for which he later apologized. But I thought his testimony was powerful and what you would expect from someone who had been through what he had been through. It was very telling to me when he was asked if he had known what he was going to go through and what his family would be put through, including death threats directed at his wife, would he have accepted the nomination? And he said no. That to me was very telling. And it worries me again, it concerns me that good people having witnessed the spectacle, the hardship, the allegations are going to refuse to serve our country. They're just not going to want to go through that. Mm. Well, after, the, uh, after that hearing, uh, the next day, uh, uh, Jeff Flake is, uh, you know, inter interacts with a woman in the, as he's on the elevator. The committee itself is in great chaos. Flake this morning told us a 
wonderful and kind of humorous in some ways story of him trying to call you on the telephone and all the other senators being around. Take me there, will you? Well, we finally connected and we did talk. I had been trying to call him. I had talked to Lisa Murkowski very early that morning, um, around seven o'clock as I recall. And then I was trying to reach Jeff Flake and I was trying to reach Joe Manchin. Meanwhile, I'm watching television and it's utter chaos at the committee and he and uh, Senator Coons are, are talking about their next step. We had been having a series of meetings and phone calls. I think I talked to Jeff Lake every single day. Mm -hmm. And he said to me on the phone, what would you think if I said that I'm not going to vote to report the nominee until we have reopened the background check that the FBI has uh, conducted and I told him I thought that was an excellent idea that I would support him. He said that he felt it should be time limited and I said I felt there was no reason why it could not be time limited given the precedent of the background check of Anita Hill's allegations only took a few days and um, so we talked about that, and he very courageously went ahead and made the proposal to the committee with Senator Coons. And I immediately publicly said that I supported it. Then later that day, Senator McConnell gathered us in his office along with some key members of the Judiciary Committee uh, to talk about the FBI investigation because what many people don't understand is to reopen the background investigation and there had been six previous investigations of Brett Kavanaugh required a request from the White House counsel. So that's what we were talking about and we were talking about how important it was that all of the people who were named by Professor Ford should be interviewed. All of the people whom she said could verify her account needed to be interviewed by the FBI. Um, I also felt that the incident alleged to have happened at Yale should be investigated as well. And I later also pressed for if the FBI, I thought this was implied, but if the FBI found other people as a result of interviewing the people named by Professor Ford, that those individuals should be interviewed too. And they were, um, contrary to what had been reported, there were not just four people right. interviewed. Now those interviews are, um, are classified, but I read each and every one of them, and there was no corroborating evidence for what Professor Ford uh, said happened that night. In fact, her best friend said that not only did she not recall any party or any incident, but she did not even know Brett Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to make clear again um, that I do believe that Professor Ford had a traumatic sexual assault and that it upended her life. But we have a presumption of innocence in this country, and we cannot dispense with fairness, the presumption of innocence, and due process just because passions are inflamed. In fact, it's, it is when passions are most inflamed that fairness is most in jeopardy. You were. Um 
Let's talk a little bit about the politics of this now. McConnell, does McConnell reach out to you during the whole process? Does he ever reach out to you? Does he, is he checking with you to see where you are and take your temperature? No, um, I think we had only two conversations during the, the process. I think that Senator McConnell respects the fact that I make up my own mind. And in fact, I did not tell him of my decision until by chance I ran into him in the Senate dining room uh, the day that I made my floor speech. And that's when I informed him and Senator Cornyn of my decision. How did it go? What did you say? I told them uh, that I'd actually come into the Senate dining room seeking a quiet place to make still final edits on my speech. I was up till 2.30 a.m. the night before, um, still working on it. And they invited me to join them for lunch. Mm -hmm. And I think they were all exercising great control. Now, I had voted for cloture, but there are times when I have voted for cloture so that the full Senate can vote on a nominee, an up and down vote, and voted no. So um, probably they were pretty sure how I would vote because I voted yes for cloture, but they were not certain. And um, so I told them that I had decided to vote for Judge Kavanaugh and that I felt that it was the right thing to do. And how did, uh, how did Senator McConnell? Well, I think he was relieved um, because, as I said, we had not had those discussions ongoing. And the stakes are very high for him and the Republicans and the president at this moment. How high were the stakes? Well, the stakes are high for everyone when you're dealing with a Supreme Court nominee. That's a lifetime appointment to the highest court in our land. So from my perspective, it is always a high stake vote uh, when I'm confronted with that kind of choice. And it feels like it's a legacy issue to him. We've, we've tracked his district court judges, the Federalist Society growth, the appeals court judges, the now two Supreme Court uh, justices. And this is, this is, as you've just said, you know, this is the court for a generation or two. And that's why I personally took so much time right. and spent more time than any other senator, I'm told, talking personally to Judge Kavanaugh, I spent over three hours uh, talking with him, two hours, 15 minutes in person and an hour on the telephone. And it's why I had briefings every other day. I, I um, read so many of his decisions and his speeches and asked him very tough questions about whether he had made any commitments to the president or the Federalist Society or the White House counsel or anyone else about how he was going to vote. So I think that this was an important decision for each and every senator. Talk to me about the, your personal, or lots of there's stories I've read about protesters literally threatening you, uh, on you. Uh, what is that like, Senator? It's very difficult and trying. I expect criticism, but the lack of civility, the death threats, the profanity that was directed at both my staff and me was very difficult. I received a fax in which the person threatened to cut off my arms and legs and slit my throat if I voted for Judge Kavanaugh. One evening here in Washington, I worked late till 9.30. I was driving home alone. My husband was in Maine. It was pouring. And there was a man who had been waiting for hours outside of my townhouse who started screaming at me, shone a flashlight in my eyes, and started a recorder. 
Um, there were protesters every Sunday for seven weeks at my personal home in Washington. Um, my staff uh, members were threatened with rape. I was threatened with rape. The number of death threats, the names that I were called, uh, were unlike anything I have ever experienced, but I feel most bad that my staff had to endure that. And I will never understand why um, those who felt strongly against the confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh thought that threatening me, uh, attempting to bribe me by raising $2 million before the vote and saying that uh, if I voted yes, they would give it to my a future opponent. If I voted no, it be refunded. That's a quid pro quo for an official act mm. and uh, is clearly wrong. After the vote, they raised another $2 million, which is fine and their uh, prerogative. But uh, this was more intense than anything I have been through. And it was so intense that the Capitol Police, in its Threat Assessment Division, decided that I needed enhanced security.